So a little bit about myself. I, I think you really have to start at the beginning. So um, I am the product of a teenage pregnancy. My mom was, my biological mother was 13 when she had me and she had my brother 11 short months later. Um, and so we were placed in foster care shortly after the birth of my uh, biological half brother. And uh, we lived in foster care until I was about five and a half. Um, and so I was adopted. I was fortunate enough to be adopted. I was adopted with my brother and um, grew up in the um, South Atlanta area in a place called College Park um, until I was uh, 14. And my parents decided to move closer home. They're both originally from Iowa, um, or they grew up and lived most of their lives in Iowa. I think my mom's technically from South Dakota. But wanted to move closer to home. Um, my dad worked um, for the News Bureau at Georgia Tech and took a similar job here at the University of Illinois, and so we, we moved here. Um, my parents have all, and so that was the summer before my freshman year of high school, and we moved to Urbana, and I went to Urbana High School, graduated from there. Uh, my parents growing up were always, you know, I was raised in a church, um, but my parents, where we lived, my dad in particular, and if you know my dad at all, my dad's a very quiet, very reserved, doesn't like to get into conversations with people. However, if he knows you, he's wonderful to get in conversation with. Um, but my dad kind of took this big step forward and was um, president of our PTA for a number of years, um, very active in doing trails and projects with that. Um, and then my mom, who's very outgoing, um, my mom's Darlene Kleppel, worked at the Regional Planning Commission office um, in the, I don't know her exact title, but uh, basically the community outreach coordinator before she retired um, a year ago, um, has always been active and involved with things and involved with service projects. We would always have international students over for Thanksgiving. That, like, that's my Thanksgiving tradition is having people over that I never met and I'll never <coughs> see again. But that was uh, that was what we did. We my my mom would we, my mom would never meet a stranger, and so I learned from that. And uh, we would we would visit things. I grew up visiting historical sites and museums and fossil hunting, and so doing all of that. Uh, moved here to. Illinois and uh, four years of high school. Uh, interestingly enough, because my my skills that I have in the trade and use now, I learned from my parents. My parents are um, not only some of the smartest people I know, but also some of the creative and um, uh, most handy people I know. My dad, uh, for a number of years, was the uh, lead mechanic at Kitt Peak, Kitt Peak National Observatory in um, Tucson, Arizona, um, or outside of Tucson, Arizona. Um, and but they built their basement, dug dug literally by hand their basement in Georgia, um, did the renovation remodel on our house here in Urbana. But college was always what I was supposed to do and what I needed to do. And so off I went to Eastern. I was going to be a teacher. Actually, interestingly enough, I was really wanted to be a physical education teacher. You can't tell it, but uh, used to be a bit of an athlete. Um, but school wasn't for me. I actually, I hate writing papers. It is, it is, I, I have never, never been a good speller. Um, I've never, um, I, I speak well, I love to read, but writing papers for me is um, one of the most pointless endeavors one can <laughs> undertake. Um, and so I, I passed bowling and speech my freshman <laughs> year of college, um, got my game up, uh, the 200s every once in a while I'd poke in there, but uh, um, but yeah, ended up being invited not to come back for a year to Eastern, and uh, so I, I took a job lifeguarding at, at the uh, Champaign Park District and met my, who would then become my wife about three years later, but met my wife, and uh, I hurt my foot the... Um, summer, that, that end of that summer, I was, we were playing tag or hide and go seek at the pool, um, doing what 18 and 19 year olds do. And I hopped a fence and I shoved the bottom of the fence up through my, Ooh. my sandal into the bottom of my foot and I didn't have health insurance. So I super glued it together. And, um, as I was starting to look for a job, um, for the fall, because I wasn't going to be going back to, to school, I found a job in the housekeeping transportation department at Provena. 
um, what was Provena at the time, and um, worked as a greeter transporter, to, uh, took patients to their, to their um, various um, appointments within the hospital, and decided after a little while, I enjoyed it, but I, you know, I, I, can, I am capable of more, and so I um, took my EMT license at Parkland, um, over a semester and actually never uh, never practiced as an EMT, but um, that led to a job as a phlebotomist in the lab. And I worked uh, nights at the lab. Um, Tiffany and I, my wife's relationship blossomed. We got married. Um, when we got married, she was wrapping up nursing school and uh, she got a job at Carl. So I hopped ship over to Carl. And uh, there I was uh, being a phlebotomist, making $10.25 an hour. Um, not a bad means or anything, but um, certainly thought I was capable of more. And so having been in the hospital, having a wife who was a nurse, I said, I'll, I'll do the nursing program at Parkland. And um, it was really interesting. So there I, there I signed up for classes, and um, I literally found myself sitting in the parking lot. I'd go to school. I'd go to Parkland. I'd drive out to Parkland. I'd sit in the parking lot for two hours during the course of what my, we had moved out of our apartment and moved in with my in-laws. And I was literally going to school but not going to any of my classes and just sitting there. And at the end of the semester, my report card came home and it was very much like you had as a kid trying to hide the report card and it finally, finally, where's your report card? And so we had this, not a knockout, but this very emotional, very heated, lively conversation. What do you want to do? And I. I think somewhere in there I said, I want to work with my hands. I want to, you know, I, I want to do that. And so um, it was, I literally went to Parkland. They ha had at the time a, a wall full of all these brochures of all these different programs that Parkland offered. And I was digging through them and they'd say what, the, what you can make coming out of, out of the programs there. And I, I stumbled across the HVAC certificate. It was a one-year program. I think English was going to be the only class that I needed to take that wasn't in line with something else. And so, and it was like $60,000. I could, I could make $60,000 or something. Maybe it wasn't even that high, but a, a wage. And I was like, I could do this. And so signed up for those classes and started taking them and just absolutely fell in love with it. it was taking a, had a residential wiring course in there that um, was one of the top students. Um, was like, I'm going to be an electrician. This is what I want to be. And so um, I told the story at uh, graduation, actually. A uh, neighbor across the street from my in-laws uh, came across the street and said, hey, they're testing. The plumbers and pipe fitters are testing um, for their apprenticeship program. You, I know you're taking some classes there. That might be something you want to look into. And so I did. I applied for that. I thought I'd take that and get some experience, test taking experience. Um, so when I went to become an electrician, I'd be ready to take that test. And, I uh, got a call back, did really well on the test, uh, took an interview, and got hired on. First, first time, first try as a plumbing apprentice. And so that kind of leapfrogged me into that. And so I think there's a, I'll try to wrap it, tie it all together. No, 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 no. So, so, so then through, um, through that, and so kind of, so here I was, I served as a deacon in church. I, um, I was a, I think I made it through Weeblos. You know, I had some of those service opportunities. Um, my mom was always taking us. I did, did several mission trips in high school and that type of thing. So I always had this service background. I always had, you know, my mom, what my parents would do and their giving and everything. And so as an apprentice, um, really bonded with my apprenticeship class. There were nine of us. And we started um, volunteering at food drives. Um, our local is... We'd give, we'd partner with um, the electricians and we'd buy a food truck and nobody would come and help distribute the food. And so they were, so we went and started volunteering at those. We rang bells for the Salvation Army. Um, right around the time, shortly after I got into the trades, um, the recession hit. And so we had several members laid off. Um, myself, along with my classmates, organized a couple food drives um, and um, money collections to do something for our, our um, out of work um, brothers and sisters, and ended up winning a service award um, from the AFL CIO, and um, just really kind of grew on that. And then as we got into, as we, I campaigned heavily for the 1% sales tax, 
when that, when that was going around the second time around, and um, we got that passed through. And then um, started getting a little bit more involved on the political side of things with doing some phone banking, um, particularly. And what really led up to it then was um, phone, doing a lot of phone banking for um, Pat Quinn, basically. Um, and it was. It was really hard calling people. You, and you probably have this similar feelings. You know, Pat Quinn wasn't great for labor, necessarily. Um, but we thought it was a, a, a better alternative to, to what was, was there at, on the table looking at us. And so, but sitting there, is, is sat at Distill, um, November 7th, 2014. And we're sitting there kind of watching elections. Um, you know, definitely lean probably more Democrat than anything. Uh, but it was sitting there, and we were losing these races that we had been involved in and everything. And I kind of said something along the lines of, why don't we do this for, you know, we've spent all this time and energy phone banking for someone we've never even met, you know, that we had these qualms about. And, you know, they say that the things are at the, at the local level. Um, my brother's calling me interesting. We never talk. <laughs> but I was talking about him. Maybe his ears were itching. Uh, yeah. But uh, basically said, hey, we should do this for one of our own. One of us should run. And so I was sitting with uh, Matt Kelly, um, who's now our um, business manager for our local, was a, in the apprenticeship class with me. Uh, David Beck, who's a staffer for Ask Me, but now the vice president of the AFL-CIO. And uh, John Nadler, who's um, a rep for the IFT. And I said, I'm going to run for school board. And so it, yeah, I kind of knew what school board was and was about. Um, the referendum had just been defeated for the first time. With, really excuse me, with children in the school or not? Yes, yes, I do have children. That I, Somewhere along the way, I managed to have some kids um, <laughs> through all this excitement. Yes, I actually ha I have a fourth grader now. Uh, Madison is in fourth grade at Kerry Busey. And uh, Molly is in second grade at Kerry Busey. And believe it or not, I have a four-month-old <laughs> at home, too. So, um, But said, hey, I, let's run for school board. And so kind of took off from there. And um, obviously, I had at some point wanted to be an educator. But I think to kind of wrap up the story of why, I had no interest in the referendum. I could have not cared less. I mean, I, was, I had voted yes for it. I was hopeful that it would pass. Um, I, li I lived in the community, obviously, um, had kids coming up, but was really interested on how can I provide those opportunities that I talked about where, you know, instead of going through all these things to get that phlebotomy license, and you can, in Unit 4, you can get your phlebotomy license, but how can I share my story? How can that be a part of of what that is. How can we get the trades more involved? And not just union labor, but trades in general to go do a lot of these different things. And so that was what what I was interested in doing and what my thought was that I, that's what I would, yes, that, that the was trades. the trades bringing that, you know, construction point to it. And as we, as, as the weeks moved along and everything, I knew, I knew the referendum would be an issue. Like we would be discussing the referendum and I thought I'd have a construction background to, to add to the table, to add to the conversation. And I have. It's helped me immensely, especially as we've gone out these past three months of sharing it and talking about these things. But that was my idea, that I would, I would contribute that. And I think I, I just have this, I've always had this sense to, to give back. And this was something that I felt that I could give and contribute. And it, it would be my contribution, if you will, to, to the community. And so I, I think that's important. Um, when I ran, and uh, really until election day, which was, I think it was April 14th, um, had no idea that I would be uh, president. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's, a, I, it was what it had to be. Um, but then with the results, how the results came in, uh, with no um, incumbents winning winning the election, and I was. I became very close with uh, with Karis. Uh, became very close with Jamar. We we had um, nine forums over that period of time where we were together. Um, had lots of conversations. Um, Karis introduced me to to people and individuals, and so. Um, but I always in my mind, I really did. I thought it was going to be, 
Karis and Jamar were going to be back on the board, that one of them would probably be president, the other one would probably be vice president, and two others would kind of nestle in there with them. Um, actually, three of us, because Jonathan ran unopposed. And um, that was just, that's not what the voters had in mind. And so um, the referendum got defeated really bad, um, about a 70 to 30 um, defeat. Um, four or five new board members were coming on the board, and it really came about then um, that we would be electing someone new um, to, to, the, to the presidentship. And um, I did know before, before the meeting, but um, that it, it was going to be it was going to be me just in our conversations and everything. But um, yeah, we got sworn on on May 4th, 2015. Um, and seems seems so long ago. Um, yeah. Not even, uh, nowhere close to two years ago. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, May 4th. Uh, three minutes later, just the process, we had elections as a, the seven of us vote in the various positions and I was president and Lori got up, I got up, we switched seats, and um, it was it was a Lori Bonnet. Lori Bonnet. I replaced Lori Bonnet, and I will tell you, um, Lori Bonnet staying on the board. Um, she 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 moved to Pittsburgh um, a, a, in January of this year, but having Lori there was the best thing possible for me. It really was, and the best thing for the board, to be honest with you, um, because Lori had. Um, this is an incredible, difficult, the referendum. It's, it's a very, and um, right, wrong, or whether you had enjoyed your tactics, um, Lori had been in effect. We would not be here without, without that referendum being put forward. And so um, having Lori there, um, being aware that Lori would check me if I was doing procedurally something wrong or not, um, but she also gave a tremendous amount of advice on how to do things and how to conduct the, to to, to conduct myself as president. And so, but uh, did a lot of reading on board procedure, a lot of um, watching those first initial meetings and making sure, it, you know, going back and thinking about how I could do things differently. But um, then just really growing into the position and um, trying to bring it bring it forward and um, own own that position. So. Does that answer your question, George? That's a whole story. Just, just what, I was hope, what I was hoping you would provide. And, and as you look back on what is it now, almost 20, 20 months, I guess, mm -hmm. on the board, you, you had no idea how much time and energy probably it would take, or did you? No. So what I tell people is the... What has happened, and nothing's really shocked me. Like, I, you know, there's some crazy things that come across, and there's some sad things, and there's some surprising things. Um, so none of that has surprised me. Uh, what has surprised me is the quantity and the amount. And so, um, and I think a little bit of that is, is just being in the position of the presidency. But I will say um, something else that I do is, and I have tremendous support from the rest of the board, um, I told you earlier I don't spell worth a lick. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the, the early upbringing that I have. Um, a part of it, though, is just how I'm wired. Um, it's never going to get better. It actually has, I shouldn't say that. It, being in this position, being forced to answer emails and write emails, and um, mm -hmm. I've, gotten, I've grown in that. I've certainly, an area I have a long way to go, but I send most of the things that I'm going to send out, um, whether it be a Facebook post or... I send it either to my wife or I send it to Kathy Richards, who's um, taken on board blogging, and she's tremendous in that aspect of it. And um, you know, Amy Armstrong, we talk daily about the district and things going on and um, the conversations that need to be had. So have a tremendous uh, board. Dr. Baker has recently joined us, and so really excited about that. Um, it's her. Um, um, her um, her experiences, uh, particularly around education policy, and really, that's the interesting thing is we've been so engrossed with the with the uh, referendum. Not that that we haven't done or discussed anything else, but that 
at some point we need to stop talking, need to stop focusing as much and deeply as we are on the referendum and move into some of those. That's almost what I'm most hopeful about is that. Just to get into the real education. Yeah, and we certainly are in that. We're certainly, we're also in an interesting point too with, with the superintendent search going on. And so not that we're on hold or anything because we're always forward, if you will. But, um, you know, thinking about that and getting that person in place. And so really wanting to really, really happy with some of the things that we're working on and where those things are going, but wanting to grow them, but um, needing the leadership that we, we bring in to, to be wanting to grow them and expand on what we're doing and doing things differently. And so computational thinking at Kenwood, you know, can we, can we bridge that into our other um, math classes across, across the elementary district and those sorts of things. Um, we have great programs at Parkland around our career technology. Um, we need facilities at Centennial so we can stop busing them. Growing our um, com AP computer science, but then can, can we start, you and I have had this discussion, can we, can we um, through legislation, move it so we're getting, those are, those are recognized credits and those, those types of things. And so um, we're working on those things, but could it be more, more of a focus or more energy? And I don't, I hate even saying that because we are working on those things, but I think that's what makes this so intense right now is that we, on top of everything else we're doing, we have this very busy referendum that we're working on as well. So. One, of the, one of the things we need to think about, I guess, how you work it with the allocation of resources. I mean, we're math science teachers, okay? Mm -hmm. That's where we're at. We've been, obviously, we're going to focus on that and everything. There's since been a debate and a discussion. I hear the argument, it, the academics versus the athletics. Mm -hmm. What proportion do we have? Can we really focus on spending this amount of money on athletics? We have so many problems in the academics. I mean, we've had students, both of us had students that have excelled that came out of Central, and we've all seen that, and there's others that are struggling. And then you've got the whole forgotten half of everything, where vocational education went the way of the dodo bird. Oh, absolutely. And it's all gone. And now if you, if Evan got you into the apprentice program gone through the school with the plumbers, I yep. mean, that's not available. And then the problem you run into, and we saw that today with the such severe deficit in math and science and writing, the student's ability to retire to go into the military is a hampered. The student's ability to go on to post-secondary is hampered, even with incredible parkland. But then the needs and requires that you learn to go into the trades Absolutely. Is significantly hampered. Yep. How, 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 I mean, how do you, I don't even have an idea, how do you see this or balancing all this, and how do you see your role of trying to balance that entire nightmare and get the information out to the public? Um, when it comes specifically to athletics and academics, see, I, I, th I think sometimes we, th we think of, Certainly in these facilities, we have dollars allocated for our athletic facilities and stuff. But um, w when I think about that, I think of like the track. We're, we're adding a second track at Southside. And um, so 10 track teams share one track currently in our district. And so um, the ability to split 10 track teams up between two tracks as opposed to all sharing one tracks, what benefit does that have on the academic side of things? Um, and then I think about all these programs where uh, the wrestling team doesn't have wrestling mats that are suitable to, to wrestle on. So I don't think we're, we're pouring a ton into um, to athletics that um, we could be siphoning off and putting towards academics. However, the things that you talk about are... Um, so expanding the facilities address, particularly around career technology, expanding those spaces, bringing those types of classrooms back. We, we have waiting lists where students aren't able to take those classes because there flat out isn't space to do it. And I would argue, so my interesting, I'm in a position right now where I could very easily go back to college. So as, as a 34 year old, I could go back to college. I work here at the university. I, I can have it paid for, for the most part. And so when, when we talk about 
know, being career, um, career or college ready, uh, really expanding that finish line. I think right now the finish line is very narrow. And right now that finish line is very much college, I feel. And so expanding that finish line where that is, is also being career ready. And so bringing in some of those Votec. But at the same time, I don't want to, um, Dr. Baker and I talk about this quite a bit, is I don't want to create a scenario where we're, we're tracking that you get into this lane and this is your finish line. But, I, and I, I talk about this all the time, so you have geometry. And so you have, you have two students, you have two very, student, uh, very different students. And here's the difference. One's, uh, the difference is their socioeconomics. And so you have, you have a student here who, who's um, flush and the parents will send and pay for, uh, pay for college. And then you have the student that has really no clear path of going to college. Maybe if they get these rocking good grades, but they're not, they're, pa they're past that, but they're a good student. And so you're sitting, you're sitting in um, freshman, sophomore geometry class and, and you're learning about these things that, what is this gonna do for this lower socioeconomic person that isn't going to have any interest in doing that or applying it or doesn't see how that. So then can we create a geometry class that is trades geometry? And so you're measuring pipe, you're talking about the practical application of what this bending conduit, um, running around a corner, cutting a corner, and start introducing those types of things where both students can be in that class um, and both are accomplishing, you're learning geometry, but now you've engaged that student. I think the big thing that we need to work on is how are we engaging our students? And um, because I think that's where, where we, we, the college finish line has been, has taken over us where the Votex has been totally pushed out. And so what can we start doing not only at the high school, but the middle school and even the elementary school level where we're engaging students all the way through and talking about and presenting these opportunities that are out there that, um, that exists. So I've got to go back and uh, back and tell a story. I always tell it, um, and, and I've told the gentleman that that I tell it. So when I got my phlebotomy license, I, I was work, I worked three nights a week at at Provena. Um, uh, phlebotomy. phlebotomy. I draw blood. Uh, I drew blood. Blood sucker. Blood sucker. Sorry, <laughs> as a phlebotomist. Um, Not the political kind. <laughs> no. no. So. Um, Those are the good ones. So I I. I worked three nights, um, a girl named Erica worked the other three nights, and then a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Hudson worked Sunday nights. Jonathan Hudson was around my age, um, African-American male, and he was working as a phlebotomist, putting himself through, through nursing school. You were at Carl? I was at Provena at this time. Okay. So, so um, was putting himself through nursing school. Flash, so this is, he had, neither of us had phlebotomy licenses, but we were both performing as phlebotomists. In Unit 4, you can get a phlebotomy license, you can get a um, nursing assistance, you can get your EMT license. These are now available, and we have a handful of students taking these classes. Fast, fast forward, fast forward, fast forward 15 years later. I'm a plumber at the University of Illinois making relatively good ways that you can look it up on Daily Alina and make $80,000 a year working, working as a plumber here at the University of Illinois. I don't have a college degree. I, I have a great job. Jonathan, who he and I were making the same amount of money, $10 an hour, working as phlebotomist. He put himself through nursing school. He worked in the um, intensive care unit at Provena for a number of years and then put himself through nurse anesthetist school at Millican. Went back to school and got his nurse anesthetist. So flash forward to that 15 years, Jonathan now makes $180,000, $190,000 a year working at Carl as a nurse anesthetist. You know, I, I think the key thing, and I know my kids went to Rantoul High School. Coming out of where we came from, mass science teachers, I ensured that they had the both solid vocational track and the solid academic track. Yep. And it was very, very successful, and they're now both very successful engineers. Because we learned that all ahead, but we learned that at the academy, every child can excel and succeed. It's just a matter of the teacher helping the student and the student making the effort and it all come together. Making that connection, gaining that interest, mm -hmm. allowing, and then also providing a, 
I, I think in today's, when we talk about the things you can see on the internet and see on the tube, everything's right there. Google, 10 years old, everything's right there that you, you've got to find something and they've got to believe. There's got to be. But you have to remember the stuff is not there on the computer and nothing bothers me more than anything. And I had a conversation on the way here today with a professor that we were with a student and walking over here. Is everybody's gone so much and rely on the technology. The vocational skills have taken a second stand without understanding the solid foundation and the math and the science and the English is absolutely essential whether you're going to go a vocational track to be a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician or a mechanic or you're going to come into academia. No, that, I, I agree 100%. What I was getting at is the, the despair and the, the everything, everything's accessible, everything all the violence, all the, all the hardship of the adult world is so easily accessible and so easily shared that, that if we're not doing those things that you just discussed, if we're not training them and creating these students and building these students, they don't have a hope, they don't have a sense or a belief that they can, there's something better for them afterwards. And so we have to, we have to be um, doing education. Another thing that I, and I'm, um, jumping around here a little bit, is discipline. Why do we send anyone under the age of third grade home for suspension? Like, what, what have we accomplished there? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, yet we do it. And we do it in this district. We do it every single day in this district. We're sending home kindergartners, first but graders, and second the graders. Problem is we'll have as teachers as we're in with the family life, with the discipline, the standards that all of us raised our kids with, what we were raised with is completely different. Absolutely. And when you've got 30 to 40 percent of the individuals in your student body from the homes they come from, there is no discipline at home. Oh. Absolutely. Students that didn't want to go home, they misbehaved to stay into our class, but stay with us after school. I don't, I don't think it's um, uh, the case necessarily, or that, that I don't know that, that studies have been done to say, that are carefully enough done to say that this is now uh, a problem of difference in scale. As from what it's been, but it may be different in response. Well, and, and I think how do you? Um, so we can't we can't just say Johnny, you stay you stay in class because we're not going to send you home. But what are those services and those right. additional things? Yeah. What are the, so third grade? And so and you you see I read literature, and I, I'm not as versed on it as others are, but. If we, if we focused on some of those things earlier, some of those social interactions, and, or it, and we're doing it, because I think part of it is working with the student to move them to a spot, but also moving the teachers to a spot. And so kind of finding that middle ground, that balance, if you will, of, of where, where is the harmony where we're doing things just differently enough, but then we're really then able to start that reading, that math, that, that, that so we, if, if we let those discipline issues stay and remain, and we don't do anything to address those, the, the social behavior, or how, 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 do you, how are you ever going to teach and be able to build upon those, those foundations? I mean, we have students, suspensions every, every other week, and they're, they're not getting what they need. And um, you, you have access to the data about how those suspensions break down, which schools, and you know, uh, um, how they might be identifiable by location or uh, socioeconomic status, status that would predominate in one of those elementary schools. Um, you also probably know the teachers and the principals who are working on this. How do you, f and, and board members who are adopting schools. Oh, that was your question. I was trying to remember what your question was. Yeah. So, so how is it? Are board member can board members be proactive in it? And also, you know what? What's the direction for? And you have the question. Quite. You have a problem. Third graders being and under being sent home, not productive. What's well, as a board member? What's the solution? And the problem, the problem is that third graders are disrupting the learning in the classroom. 
there seems to me there ought to be, if there isn't already, some other alternative other than coming in the pump. And there is. Uh, we, we have, so Senate Bill 100 was, was, was yeah. the, the whole zero tolerance and everything. And th that's a, something that I'm very proud of as a district. We're, we're fielding phone calls every single day. How are you doing this in Unit 4? We've changed nothing. We have not had to alter a single thing that we're doing because we're that far ahead of how we do discipline with our actions program and, and sending them there. And now we're growing actions into the school itself. And so we're, we're starting to look at that. Some of it is, I think, thinking about policy and doing it, doing it correctly, because I know of other school districts around the country that have instituted a policy where we're not. But I can't, we can't just make the policy that says, we're not suspending. There has to be things in place that we yeah, are doing absolutely. it. So those services and things have to be in place. And so, and then kind of what George alluded to, figuring out, kind of following the data and being a little strategic about it. But I can tell you, we have these issues at all 12 of our elementary schools where it's, there's a little bit of that is because of school of choice and, our, you know, our population is, um, you uniquely diverse if you will, it, it, with a choice it, it, that's part of part of what choice does but um, there's certainly pockets and cells of it um, and I think I think there's I don't think anyone is exempt from not I don't want to say blame but there has to be responsible so if it's not family can the community and so we're working with the churches um, on you know, Sunday school, can you be doing some of these, uh, talking about some of these things? Can, you, can, you, can we be opening our schools up longer into the evenings to be, to, to be centers for tutoring and stuff like that? And so um, the teachers, trying to move teachers forward. Right now we're um, Dr. Is it Dr. Olive, uh, PBF, personal behavior, looking at how, how we look at ourselves. You know, what is... What is what it you know, and we're an iceberg. You and each of us are, is an iceberg, and we have what we present out for. But then, what what is our character? What are our thoughts? What are our beliefs below the waterline? And how are those impacting how we teach and how how we treat our students and everything? And so, and then um, moving the students. So, see, the whole thing comes down. I think with a referendum or anything, come back from money is. What are the achievements and so what for this program? How does it make better? How is it going to prepare the student better? What are they going to end up doing that they don't have now? So if, if that, that answer can be solid given to the, to the taxpayers and this is what the direct benefit is and this is what the outcome is going to be, then the probability, you know, somebody else other than all of us that are bandwagon cheers yeah. are going to be out there saying, okay, yeah, let's go along with the pay it. But as I see right now, looking from the outside, from all the different perspectives, having taught at Central and been there and done all this stuff, it's a no-win situation right now because the perception they were now here we're going to get hammered with an additional tax. Mm -hmm. We don't see any direct benefit where we're seeing a whole quality improvement outside of that finite group that's always going to excel no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so the question then comes into, okay, we're going to do that and spend, but we want to focus this much money on, active, on athletics versus the real problems are where we don't have solid vocational education and academics combined for every student. So it's, 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 I, mean, it's, I mean, I think you're in a wonderful person to be in a wonderful job to do what you're doing, but I, I, it, it seems to me like a nightmare. Oh, it, it, it's certainly <laughs> a challenge. <laughs> I'm on video now, don't. Don't corner me into anything. Uh, no, it's certainly a challenge. Um, again, I go back to, so here, here, here's uh, going to the referendum. The referendum is, is four things, is driven by four things. Uh, number one is capacity. We, we are at 100, for, we're busting at the seams. We have 10 trailers in this district. So we flat out don't have space for, for our students. So capacity is number one in some people's eyes. <laughs> You know what I mean? It, it truly. Well, that, I mean, that's, that is number one, because you have to educate all children, Fairly. and if you don't have a desk for them... Well, well you'll, you'll, see, you'll see what I mean when I go to that. So, uh, I think that hasn't been brought out that I've seen totally. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, oh I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my heart sinks. But it goes, it goes to that, and so I agree and I hear you. When, when you tell me you, you haven't, 
That capacity is the first thing I say every single time. The reason we're building these facilities is we're at 104%. We've had record, every single freshman uh, kindergarten class for the past six years in unit four has been bigger than the previous one. We are, we're at over 10,000 students now in the district. We're, there was a bubble and I still, I almost think it's wrong data. It's such a weird bubble. We had 12,000 students in the district for like two years in the 70s, but then it disappears. And it's like, what, what happened to 2,000 students? And so I'm like, did a two get added where the zero should be? Anyway, uh, so capacity number one. And then um, curriculum programming, exactly what you said. Bowtech students have no space. There's no space exists at Centennial for Bowtech well, education. Teachers left either. I, I understand that. There's some good ones though in our district, working in our some district. Incredible teachers. Absolutely. Well, just so you know, I meant that across the board, but we have good Bowtech teacher, excellent Bowtech teachers. So adding um, career technology space at Centennial for those students so they're not bused every single day into Central and expanding on what we have. We have 40 students working in eight welding booths in a welding class. I'm telling you as someone who's been in a welding booth, we have, it's you need a, a, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to get and grasp and understand. However, at the same time, alluding to the great, wonderful teachers we have, our female Val Victorian was one of those welding students and took second at state, at the state welding uh, for high schoolers. So we do it very well. We need to be giving everybody else. We need, and then we have 100 people on the waiting list for that each year. And so my idea is, so grow, grow those, uh, those areas. Our science classrooms are set up just like you would imagine a class science, well, just as they were when you were there. Yeah, yeah. We and were so, there. Yes, and so, so bringing those forwards, creating it so you can do class and then go into a lab and move in and out of that situation to do it differently, to do it how we should be doing it. And so th that's number two. And this was where I go into, is, is capacity the number one thing? Accessibility. We have two elementary schools that are unaccessible to students, unacceptable, uh, unaccessible to faculty, to parents, to grandparents, to community members. And today in unit four, where we are with the university, where the university is a leader in disability, we just don't feel like that's right and appropriate. And so making those schools accessible, Dr. Howard um, will come down. And so obviously that new building and then safety. Centennial High School is not a very accessible building. Amy Armstrong um, has to take her daughter to the back door, ring a bell, walk clear down to the other end of the building, take an elevator up, walk clear down to the other end of the building, cut across a hallway, and back to the offices. When I was teaching at Southern at Centennial, after I got trashed, I couldn't get up the steps. I had to go around and get in. Yep, absolutely. So creating a safe, secure entrance, bringing the administration down, Right now, you can buzz into the front door, walk up the stairs, take out the, the hall monitor, and you have free reign of that school and never have to go through an administration office, never have to go through a secure entrance. It's one buzz in, I'm here to come to the office, and you're go you can disappear into that school. So bringing those offices downstairs, putting an elevator in that space, making it a, a safe, secure, accessible entrance. So, did I cover all four? The four mm -hmm. things, yeah. So, and depending on who you are, what you are, those those are all things. And not once did I mention athletics in there. Yay! <laughs> I know, and it's hard. And it's hard. But then, but when 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 we talk about athletics, when I think about the tr the track is a big one, and then the field space across at Centennial, where we're at the old YMCA, the fact that marching band now can walk across the street instead of loading up buses and yeah. busing over to Centennial and doing brand practice. They have, they'll have a turfed field across the street that they can practice on. Yeah, and it was so strange because when I was teaching biology, I took my kids over to Westside Park. Yep. And that's where we held field classes. Yep. And it's, it, and it, that's how they've been doing it for a hundred years. Yeah. I mean, it, it literally is how they've been doing it. And so I, I understand and it's it's a it's a small portion of it, and and here's here's what I tell people, and this is this is kind of, and it goes again back to the students, 
and having the students involved in the superintendent search is, is finding that balance. So what we did with the superintendent search, and I'll, try, I'll tie this back into to what I'm talking about, is A, we, we hired um, a consultant um, to come in and con help us conduct that search, basically filter everything. And the reason for that is, I think more so because of how we, uh, we've been so involved and so out in the community, is that we, we were accessible to a lot of people um, but also not, ex we needed to separate ourselves from, from that influence of outside groups of people. Um, I, I'm going to out myself a little bit here, but I'm on the, um, control shift, um, newsletter. Uh -huh. Did you know that? On, on our list? Yeah. Oh yeah. I and so, that. so I'm on there. And so uh, one particular conversation, um, was talking about um, getting getting together. I think you were going to do a group of thirty. You were going to meet with the board, the board members. Try to meet with all the board well, members. We talk, um, talk, about, about, yep, uh, talk uh, about talking about influencing the, the superintendent, super, superintendent the search. Yeah, I remember that. And so, um, and then I will tell you, and I I'm sure you will believe me when the, yeah. I tell you this. I was having administrators that I knew and trusted and, and really talking to me about who and who I shouldn't be thinking about as internal candidates. Oh, yeah. And then I have business members and business leaders and former board members that have influence and play and swing in, in the community. That's one of the most interesting things. They're saying who and how I should hire as a superintendent. And I have... The kids should allow me to hire. So, so, when I t so what we did was we had the survey. And it is. It's a corny little survey that it, it had 16 questions on it. Pick the five that, and if you look at them, I'd love all 16 to be ultimately in the superintendent. And kind of where we're at is that at this stage in the process, it, it, it's going to be, you're going to get a lot of different qualified applicants. And so allowing everybody's voice to be as possible heard as equally and then we we had the um we had we brought in isb it's the it was the most expensive part of bringing in the survey we brought in two people for two days to conduct community engagement one-on-one -on -one. how did that go we had uh under 40 staff members participate and we carved out time for them and i think we had under 30 community members participate so not very well. Great conversation with, with, with the people that came and spoke, but we weren't a part of that. We weren't involved in that. And so ISB will take that and puts it all together for us and we'll read it. And I have read through the comments and it's, it's very, it's very um, common themes throughout and everything. And so it, ju it just allowed us to, to do that. And so the same thing with with the with the if i didn't have the new field space on this referendum i would lose half the people <coughs> i would just as because i'm not at the interstate drive i've lost a huge portion of the people it's finding that balance of of mixing in the needs at the academic level the needs at our athletics level that having two tracks and being able to get kids home two, three, four hours earlier is going to be a benefit to their academics. It really is. Um, having, um, having the field across this way to, to do it, creating, and they're still not equal. I hear it all the time. Centennial still gets to walk out the back door. It's a big deal for a lot of people. It's also a big deal not for a lot of people. And so it, it's, it's finding that compromise, finding and building that, that plan. And again, I fall into that category that no matter what we roll out, or I still don't think it's the best plan, to be honest with you. I think there's, but there's my favorite plan, I'm saying this on camera, um, was a uh, one campus, two high school model at Centennial. Yeah, see, it's a good idea. And a lot of, it, we agree on why there's a lot of good in that. You, 
you'd have to there'd have to be some joint partnership with the park district, or you'd have to have your athletics off site somewhere else, which you, you could do. But the, the, there's the benefit and gain in that. I still think that's a fantastic idea when you're talking about then then you could have a Votec building where just full of welding booths, full of drafting rooms, full of AutoCAD rooms, full of all of that. It's a great idea. It's a great plan. See, I think, I it, think one of the things, too, is a perception. Because the U of I is so yeah. great here, and Parkland is so great. Uniform the great, schools too. are good. How do we get the achievement within the local schools up to the level of the expectations for a community with two great schools? Because you've got that whole proportion of selling extraordinary going to do good, and then you've got 60%. Uh, um, I, th I think, honestly, it, it's, it's continuing to grow the partnerships, expanding on what we have in these bubbles and pockets. I will tell you this, and we'll see, it, you know, um, people come and go. It is, it is hard. It is hard to, uh, you know, I'm, I've got two and a half plus years left in my, I, I've already started thinking about, is this something that I can do for another term after this? It is hard. So more people have to be involved. More people have to care. And it, it has to be, there has to be more support. I, I thought when you were talking about mobility, you were talking student population mobility, which used to be 25%. Is it still there? What do you, uh, Students coming in and out of the district? I think it's a, a I don't even think it's that high, to be honest okay. with you. Um, it, was, it used to be incredibly high of okay. coming and going and coming and going. I don't think, we, I mean, we're pretty stable on. Well, numbers, yes, but actual physical students. You mean the mobility of the students? The mobility of the students. I what, thought we had what students percent, coming in and out all the time. What, what percent of students that enter at Central actually end up there four years later? What, not by dropping out, but because they move. No, I understand. Yeah. I, I think it's, I would say, I haven't heard that number being that yeah. thing. And so, um, to be honest with you, though, I, and that's why I'm guessing it's not that high, because I think I would hear more about a number like that. But you do certainly hear of the mobility in the community. And everything, but we do remain pretty stable. Okay. Um, well, in, in terms of overall numbers, yeah. Yes, um, but I think part of it is, it is, I find it rewarding, and uh, that might be unique, <laughs> uh, it, but I'm also at the same time exhausted. Yes. I'm so tired, and our board's so tired, and our administration's so tired, and so I think part of it is because the referendum and, and what it's consumed and the energy it's consumed. But some of these things are just, and you see, you, um, you know, you have members that were at Kenwood that are now moving on, uh -huh. that it's going to be difficult to, to replace and find. It. And sure. if, you, if you lose a couple more, I sit here and wonder, to be honest with you, how can we sustain it? How do we, right. how do we continue how do growing that? So I talked ever so briefly with the new chancellor the other day. One of the neat things is I do get to meet a lot of people, and I, I was in a situation where we, um, Amy Armstrong and I were with him at, a, at an event, and we talked for about five minutes. And he is really interested in this kind of career, uh, from cradle to career type concept. And I think, that's some of, I think that starts addressing some of the things. If this country would really look at itself and do a year of maternity leave for the mothers, yeah. And um, you know, do a solid for the, for the fathers in those um, in those relationships, and then really look at taking care of the child after that year until they get to to. <laughs> you would solve a lot of the problems and issues, yeah, and this yeah. kind of goes to this is getting outside of this is more free speak. I'm not. I'm I'm thinking of some of the conversations that I've listened to here when we're talking about educating voters and stuff. I think there's portions of our society that is really scared, it wants to continue to suppress the vote. I think we're very fortunate when we look at, especially here in Champaign yeah. County, and, and some of the work that Gordy has done. Um, and so, but it's interesting that I, I, whereas I think Gordy's doing a fantastic job, I still hear people frustrated that he, he should be doing more. And so finding that, that line and that balance, and it's always going to, be, there, there's, percentages of our population that don't want our kids to be, 
you know, you and I think, yes, exactly, yes, yes, we're going to create, we're going to create all these, or, um, you know, why isn't voter registration automatic when you, when you get your license or when you do anything, when, whenever you do that, why isn't it just an automatic thing? Yeah, but you still run the problem, even when you have the voter registration, the participation, well, that's and, what and all this comes into play. And then the other question, which I but, guess I don't know how you can deal with it, is the teacher, the expectation, take expectation of what the teacher and the school are responsible to do today has changed extraordinarily <laughs> yeah. from the time that we went to grade school, we went to college and got Absolutely. up and started teaching over 30, <clears throat> way over 30 years ago. Also, what you're allowed to do is a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. Like the next day. Yeah. That's part of it. It comes to the other question. Do you, as a board, work with teachers as well, or just with administration? It is, it is I would say, and so this is interesting because um, you added the, I get to see the video before. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, we will send you the video. No, and I, 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 I don't say that because. You could write just. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yes, is it as good as, you, you asked about the school, uh, the adopted schools. So I have a full-time job. I work 40 hours a week as a plumber. Yeah. I don't work 40 hours at the U of I. Today, right now, sitting here talking to you alone, I'm taking an hour of vacation time to, to oh. be here. <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. fine. It's important. Yeah. But, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, I have to. That's, 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 how, that's how it is. And so I take, I take um, I'm, I'm permitted to take time to... Um, um, I have 40, uh, working at the university, I do have 40 hours over a year. should have given you the free time off, your would pay to come and help us <laughs> <and> talk to <laughs> um, I have some elected official time that I'm able to ta tap into. I try to save it for, um, I have a conference in November I'm going to, I try to save it for those bigger bulks of time. And I'm also now allowed to, um, approved, take it without pay. And I, I, so I mix, I mix my vacation time without pay and my elect, elected official time. And so right now, um, my, my adopted schools are Kenwood, uh, Booker T. Washington, and um, I have Franklin. Franklin is my middle school, and I want to say Central is my high school, but I... Much for one. <laughs> no, well, there's only seven board members and we have 19 schools, and so it, we've got it spread out. I will say Kathy, Kathy, Amy, Dr. Baker, Lynn, even Jonathan do a fantastic job of getting out to, to the schools, um, filling in, going to events. I go to events. I went to the academic awards night at Central. I went to it at Centennial the other night. Um, I go to the 3K at Booker T. Washington. I've gone to, went to the opening ceremony. I have not gotten out to the schools as much as I would have liked to as that. However, I do have um, some good relationships with teachers. Um, several of our board members have relationships with teachers. We meet once a month with the upper management of it. I am kind of in that unique situation where I'm actually a delegate to the AFL-CIO and um, IFT and CFT have delegates to that, so I have some relationship with there. I do know that we had a, um, a it, it went to we had negotiations that went all the way to clear to a strike vote. Um, however, I think if you talk to both sides, at least my opinion on it, it was um, still a very clean, respectful um, process and that we, we, you saw it wrap up relatively quickly. And so um, the relationships there, it certainly needs to grow and expand. Um, and so, and we do that. I have a, a Good talk. I can call Jen White up right now if I wanted to. Um, I have some other teachers that I can do that with, mm -hmm. and so. Um, but it's a lot when when you think I. That's what I sometimes say. And we, you and I, were talking about this when we ran into each other. Is that um, I have a full time job, and um, I also have a full time volunteer position with being on the school board. And, and a four-month-old at home. And a four-month-old at home. <laughs> I, I, and that's, I mean, we, we treat this, and we talk to the girls about this, that this is, this is, you know, dad is board president, but 
it's, it's really a family, my in-laws and my parents, you know, um, it's a, it's a, that's what I tell people to think about. But you know, you're giving a gift to your family, you're giving a gift to the community, you're giving a gift to your kids right now. Oh, God. absolutely. They, can't they, be measured. Yeah. No, and that's what I hope, and that's what I tell my parents. Like, that's what I, I tell my dad. Dad, I do this because I remember watching you go to PTA meetings and know that you d were uncomfortable in that situation, and you, there was a tr nature trail that got built behind the school, and you did that, and we go back 15 years later, and it's still there. And so those, those are the things. It doesn't make it easier, though, um, but... I kind of got off. What, what, what's, what's next? Because I, I got this horrible feeling based on the economics and just all the stuff set aside what we talked about. Mm -hmm. The referendum is going to fail. You think it's going to fail? Absolutely. Oh, I don't. <laughs> I don't you. I don't fail. But yes, so what's next? Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm not expecting an answer because, I mean, we all know what we would like. We all know, understand no. the need for education and how we improve the quality of education. Yep. But it not necessarily means that we have to go to the super fancy technology because that hasn't really improved everything. Yeah. It's made quality better sometimes, but it hasn't really improved it. Absolutely. And that's the thing. I sit here and tell people that this isn't glitz and glam. And I mean, we need improved network in our schools. You know, when Central needs an improved network system there to, to do to have the computers and have those online and up and running. But this isn't about glitz and glam. And so we'll, we'll have to go back to the drawing board. We'll have more trailers. I mean, we have 10 trailers. We'll have more trailers, even if this passes next year, just because that's how long we're out from breaking it shovels to the ground. And so uh, as a board, we're going to have to go back to, why do you, just out of curiosity, why, why do you think it will fail? What do you think it, the cost? I think the overall cost and just how the economics are hitting everybody, what our cost yeah. of livings are, what our expenses for food, for gas, for everything else, our medical expenses, because every time you turn around, it's going up, and yet we're on a total fixed income. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're our income is not going. We're retired, and that's fixed now. Yeah, so the amount of money we have available is not going to increase. <laughs> yeah, gonna, no, and so, and so abso year. absolutely, and so... Um, but I, I agree with you. If if this fails, I I think we've done through the process that we entered into, and it was taking. It was building on the previous board's work and the the conversations and the 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 anger, if you will, that came out of it. Yeah, is that, that is that? Um, so I think we've answered that. I think we have a plan that people. It's not glitz and glam. Yes, there are some facilities and every in it and all. But I think we have a plan that people aren't like. I just flat out don't like that location. And you do. You certainly have some people that don't like the location and will vote no on that. But for the most part, the community support is there for the plan. I think it's a cost. And so I think that'll be what we go back to the drawing table with is cutting some of these projects out and looking at, you know, getting that cost lower. Yeah. And so that's, a, unfortunately, that what else are we left, left with but to do to continue the conversation? And to be honest with you, I don't know if it's something that we turn around and do again in the spring. You know, because then you start thinking about how that election will set up with, you know. You mean you would put the referendum on in the spring? Or not. No, I, or not. If this one doesn't pass, then you've got to give yourself a break. But the, the problem right. is, and it was true of the last time, I believe, the crisis, can I remember okay, Susan Zola coming to, yeah. to the board meeting after the the um, plan failed last time. She said, the kids are here now. Yes. You know, we've got portables. We've got the kindergarten class is way bigger than we have capacity for. So the kids are there. The space is not. The crisis grows. Yeah. You but, know, if we have another layoff here and, and there were a year and all over day and day where the economics are everything, more additional layoffs are all possible. Absolutely. So individuals are sitting there looking, what is my fixed budget? What is my, what is my expectation? If this goes up $300 a year that I have to pay on my property taxes, mm -hmm. what is it worth doing? So when you look at the whole life, they got a child in there, they understand education, they're a teacher, they're going to do a gay rock team and I'm poor. Yep. But the other one's saying, 300 bucks? I ain't got 300 bucks. Absolutely. And, and I'm fine. 
To be honest with you, the person that can't afford it doesn't want to, like, the, the no tax person, I'm fine. If you are educated on what it is and what's at stake, I, I'm fine with the no vote. I really am. I mean, it, yeah, I know that sounds hard. If, 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 if you're an educated, and if you're, but if you're, if some of it when it's, this board hasn't listened, this board hasn't, you know, it's, and there's nothing, I, and I won't ever say that. It, you know what I mean? We, we have listened, and we're never going to be able to listen to, I sit in meeting after meeting that's open and public, we met, and we have a lot of participation, but it's, I don't know, and that's what we talk about, what more could we do? I had a realtor last night telling me that you haven't gotten this out very well, and I'm like, I, Tuesday night, I was at three referendum things. I, I was gone, I got off work, literally changed up work, ran around to three different referendum things and made it to award ceremony at Centennial. Last night, I went to um, two hour and a half plus referendum conversations, one at Central and then dashed back over to Centennial and stopped by my union hall and talked to members about the referendum after my meeting at the Savoy. I don't know what more I can do. I don't know, to be honest with you, what more my wife will allow me to do. Yeah. I think and so, what I've seen, what I've heard is extraordinary what you've achieved and where you've been and why you're doing it. And God bless you. Thank <laughs> no, and I, I appreciate that. that. And everybody's doing that. All the board's doing that. And we have superintendent and assistant superintendent were at this meeting. It, you know, we, we, are, we are putting the work in, but we have residents that have no idea. They have a ballot sitting at their home. <laughs> I'm not calling you. You know what? I'm waiting for the day after it when we could talk about other things. I mean, yeah. there are so many things that yes, are. Will you come back? And, yeah, yeah, I can come back sometime. Uh, Let me build some time. I was. Yeah. I, <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask Rebecca. Yes. Have you, as a voter, as a citizen, um, gotten the answers about the referendum? That Makes you knowledgeable. And you too, probably. No, I don't know. You are not. Know, <laughs> no, knew, knew nothing about it walking in here. Oh, wait, at but this meeting? After this meeting. Yes. yes. Yeah. So this was useful, but I would, I would have known so about it. Have one, have one, vote. one vote. Done. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> Start the clock. <laughs> That's a vote. It's not so, a yes vote. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go back before this all breaks up and just yeah. tell you that there's a, a fabulous program in Evanston where the geometry class builds a house for Habitat for Humanity. And George probably knows Mary Joy Carnage. She was yes. talking with her yesterday. And it's wonderful. If that is something that Unit 4 would ever want to bring in, I mean, I'm all in on that. You know, okay. if you need somebody to... I'll be on that meeting that Rachel Deal because my kids were yeah. totally oh, so flash involved in it. To be honest with you, some of these uh, smaller rural communities are kicking our butt yeah. on, on our right. BOTEC and what, what those students are capable yeah. of. And I can tell you, as as a union member, that's the, that's who's getting those jobs. And they're great guys and great people and gals. Every year and, at yeah. the academy, yeah. the juniors built for Rose Cottage, and then we took it down and we put it back up the next year. Yeah. I think we'll see some exciting things over the next couple of years. That, and to be honest with you, when we get to go back to that, that's a, what will re that's what will keep me yes. in the district and yeah. potentially volunteering is the potential to, to, I can't speak enough of Mark Shagnon and some of the work he's doing and some of those programs that we're doing some of those things and can we just grow and expand upon them. Um, he talks about a, uh, a facility in South Dakota, which is just, it sounds fascinating, but um, they, they build a house at the school and it's like a parade that town lines up and they parade it to, to a location and things like well, that. Well, that's what they do in Evanston. Yep. Yep. And Evanston gives the property. Yep. And yeah. so, yeah, the, creating some of those partnerships, it has some great relationships formed with the Park District, the city, really growing on some of those things. Um, can we, th this is something maybe to start thinking about you math and science people. Um, so we have these devices. We have one-to-one -one devices and the ability for students to take them home. But if there's no Wi-Fi access for them at home, mm -hmm. 
there's no there's no reason for them to have it. I, I, I got to keep going back to the same thing from the practical slide point. I know. And that you can turn and use that wrench and use the screwdriver and all this other stuff, and that you can take the measurement. Yep. There's a problem we see day in and day out all over this community. Is the individuals working at Walmart they can't even make change? You want to know what I think? Uh, you you math people in the room? Yeah. Fractions. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So, okay, if so you can you, learn your fractions, you, 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 they, they don't know it now. I know, but that goes to I, I if you know your fractions, you can do change. You can do yes. You well, can fractions. You can't do anything. No, the machine could do the change. But that's the no, thing. Yeah. The vast majority. If you can read and do fractions, I can make you a plumber. I'm dead serious. Oh, okay. you, I'm serious. If if you have if you have this and you know fractions and you know how to read, I can make you a great plumber. Yes. I can tell I can show you what happened firsthand when the batteries and sun don't shine, what do you do next? And when that collapses, well, you don't work that. I absolutely I absolutely yeah. 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 We're gonna have a lot bigger problems than that. But but I also what what I mean by that is that yes, yeah, so we need to have a population uh, where you need to do that. But at the end of the day, for for as the if you can have the fractions, if you can read a tape measure, and if you, if you can read a tape measure, then you can read a measuring cup. My son hires a conier, and he's had brand new engineers coming to go by, and because they can't do the math on the board without the calculator, he couldn't keep them employed because they couldn't do the job as necessary to produce the product. I I understand that. So the kid who has gone through, and I agree a whole hundred percent, but the kid who has bounced around from home to home, from foster home to foster home, who hasn't had an address for the 18 years that he's been in high school, that was abused as a child, that was food insecure and didn't get meals on the weekends and stuff like that, I need to be at least teaching him to read and know, know his fractions. When he needs a fraction, and what, whether he needs to add and subtract it or multiply it, divide it, and then his phone will... And I know that sounds yeah. very, very basic, but... But that's a key. It is a key. You have a world opened up to you if you can, have, if you can read. And I have a daughter who's dyslexic. And my big... I, if she gets nothing more out of, out of, out of her public education, but fractions and reading, she can go on to be, because I want to let you know in, on a little secret. All I know how to do is read and fractions. I'm, and I'm being honest to you. That's all I know how to do. And I can make you the most beautiful cake. I can smoke you the most perfect meat. I can, I can lead a group. I can lead a district of 10,000 students and 2,000 employees. You can build a house, you can repair a house. Absolutely, and that's what I and if the world goes to pot and I don't have that tomorrow, I can still do all of those things because I have learned how to read. I know how to access things. I know how to, I know how to measure things and, and not waste material. And, and so, one thing that changed in this real industry, when I was in eighth grade, we had to take a half, half year of home economics and a half year of shop. Male or female, you had to go through both. I think you should do that every semester. It's the most extraordinary experience to this day because we learned how to cook and we learned how to build. Let's, I, I want to, I want, I, I talk, and this is, this is, this is my passion, is that like, I can, I can think of all these things uh, of um, talking with the chamber, and it, this will happen, like, this, these are the things that will sustain me through, through this, is um, food trucks. Let's buy each of the high schools a food truck. Yes, think about this. You buy a food truck. And so the first semester of this class, after taking some, some classes to lead up to this, but your, your junior, senior year, your first semester is thinking about what your, what your food's going to be. What, then you're thinking about the design, what your food truck design is. And then the shop class can do that. Parkland has two paint booths, state of the art, that you could, you could do this through, through them with them. So you're doing marketing. You're having... Then you have the biology class doing the hydroponic, um, you're growing your own fruits and vegetables, but you grow this education around a food truck, around a food truck. Think of all the things that you could bring in, all the things that you could learn, all the things that you could do that have nothing to do, that isn't in a book, and you, it, it isn't, it's, it's all there and all these different things, things that you could do. 
You need seven food trucks. <laughs> two to sell lunch at Central, two to sell lunch at Central, <laughs> and one for each of the three middle schools. And then the kids, the seniors who were in business, could be running the, the home. They could be the making. Seniors. They could be making wages. You could. Yeah. You could have. Yeah. No, it's. It, I, I want to start off with three, and I want. I want one. We'll start off with one. I know that's what we'll do. <laughs> because I am. I'm talking to the Chamber of Commerce. Let's yeah. get a food truck and let's start a program. At, um, her child goes to what's, what's Central. What's your modeling here at the Beer Hall of the Department of Food Science? That's my yeah. next step. Yeah. At, my next step is we, we should have a Brevere Hall. We should have a, a cafeteria that the students work in yeah. that provide. We have free and reduced lunch in this community, 51% in our district. Why not create an opportunity for it? If you're getting your breakfast at, at school, you're getting your lunch at school, what are you getting for dinner? Who knows? Whatever you put in your pocket. Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever gets put in your book bag, potentially. So create the situation, and maybe have a couple of them, but grow it at one place. But create a, create a program at a school where then students have an, abil have an ability to work that, have it all student, yeah. student run. But you and I, those of us in this room, we go and pay for that meal. But then families also come that don't have to pay for that meal, that are free or a reduced rate. For that meal, and nobody knows. It's a you, you can set it up to a, to a model. You get a card, and and you swipe through, and you ha you have a community and an ability to to nourish the community, employ the community, teach skills and trades. Um, no, I'm so it's those ideas. Well, is, okay, so I, I will tell you this: there is an issue with who prepares the food for the kids. They have to be licensed by the state and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We have they, our Mary, our food services, yeah. and her gal teaches the classes at Parkland for the yeah. food sanitation. We have to have kitchens that prepare that. We already have the kitchen. Yeah. Those students, it's an eight-hour course. Okay. And guess so what? And guess what? There's a job at the University of Illinois. There's jobs, jobs of galore <laughs> at the University of Illinois. That one of the things that you'll do after getting accepted to that job is get a food sanitation license. But tell you what, you already have your food sanitation license and you spent two, three years at your high school, at your schools learning these things and you already know how to cut and slice vegetables. You're gonna get very easily that $14 an hour job that already exists and you're gonna move up because you've been in that environment for two, three years. And then, oh, you've got a job at the University of Illinois. You get reduced tuition. You get reduced tuition or free tuition. It, it, it's, it's, it's that, those are the different pathways. So now I've created a different pathway to college that had nothing to do with that finish line, that race to, to, to get there at graduation. Yeah. And you've, you've teaching them a skill, you've given them, you've literally food on the table and money in the pocket to do those things. And so that's how I envision what we should be here, where we, where we are and what we do. Ag. I have 80 acres to the north here, that, yeah. and we just passed legislation that'll pay, after five years, half of it, the five, leading up to those five years that teachers fully employed for the first two, 80, and then bump down to get to it. We should be doing these things. Drones, I, I know it's part, but it's all part of it. Wind, solar, Tesla's just making these, um, these solar, solar sh shingles. I know a guy who graduated from Centennial, went to Stanford, um, went to MIT, was one of my groomsmen in my wedding, and told me five years ago, I kid you not, that this was going to be the future. Has a job at Tesla now, <laughs> and Tesla really? just came out with these, with these solar shingles. And so, but growing and learning these things and doing these things, and, and I, I have this conversation too. If we can start teaching our students, even if they don't take some of that knowledge, that building and, and working, but if you can learn to change a faucet out, if you can learn to solder a pipe, you start, you as a community, our community start stops relying so much on those things of some of the, you know, and that's saying where, but but then you're also then able to start providing that service for your neighbors and your family, and you start you start bridging that gap, closing that gap on on those things of e truly educating them with the, the knowledge. The thing about that, and I, I would love to have this, you know, you have those skills, the amount of money you have to use to alleviate the pay for that services absolutely reduces, so then yeah. the other money can be used for other better things. Yeah. And then if you could run your own business. And so if you, if you were part of that food tr service truck, you could, you, you'd have the knowledge and a baseline for how to do that, how to do inventory, how to, how to market yourself and how to do that. And so 
those small little different things that, that you can grow upon and, and, and do. And so. Well, my vote is when the referendum passes on Tuesday, you go straight to the food truck idea. Okay. <laughs> That's the best idea so far. That's no, an excellent it's, idea. It's a, well, and the thing is, we thrive in a community that uh, they're all over the place. That's they're right. literally all yeah. over the place. And so, what I, what I envision then is all three high schools having it. And so, then it becomes a contest. And the contest is what is what is your what are you gross? You know what I mean. So maybe you're doing uh, filet mignon on your truck, but <laughs> then you've got to figure out if you're doing that, you're going to have to be able to charge it and do all that. But then, but then, Tuesdays is Central's food truck day. Wednesdays is Centennial's food truck day, and um, Thursday is um, Urbana's food truck day. And you go to the different high schools. You've got three. Three different food trucks. You go to Research Park when they do it there on Friday, whatever, and you hit festivals and farmers markets on the weekends, and and you're learning something, and you're making money, and you're doing those things. It, it, the possibilities are limited. I will tell you, the problem and the issue is for all these great ideas, you need a whole bunch of people behind it and supporting it and believing in it, and then either committed to stay staying with it or committed to to getting someone to come back in and behind it to sustain it. Because to be honest with you, if we do any of these things, we have to find a way to sustain that. And some of these things are, are the drive and the desire by people to do it. So you have to start getting people to believe in this is the right. And to be honest with you, this is a society issue, I think, here in the United States, in our country, is that we look out for ourselves very well and we worry about ourselves very well we sometimes have a really hard time. It's, I, I can't tell you, it, one of the most frustrating things is that um, some of the friends, and it, like they appreciate it and they understand it, but it, I haven't inspired them to do oh, anything, to, to, to do much and to volunteer. You don't see any spike or uptake, and I think it, it's just hard. I think part of it is they see how hard and hear and read some of the things, so some of the discouragement maybe, but that it, it's hard. It's really hard to to do it. And so that's what we've got to grow is the willingness and desire. Everybody has commitment, not everybody has vision. Yeah. When you come back in the spring, you hate so much of your time. No, it's okay. okay. I'm so grateful that you, you've been here. You've given up so much of your vacations. <laughs> no, it's okay. Come and talk with us, and this is, you've, you've done what I would hope. Yeah. Uh, picture of, of all that you have to deal with. So and this is what I. Citizen of the board. Yeah. So and I this is. This is what I like. Oh, yeah. I like meeting and talking to you.